Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one and challenging, I might add, for the last three months, that would be October, November, and December of 2014. This particular lesson is entitled Enduring Temptation. It's lesson number three in that series for October 18 of 2014. <clears throat> I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to do some looking at a number of verses, not just in the book of James, which is our main subject, but several other places as well. So if you have your Bible in hand, let's bow our heads together and let's ask the Lord to guide us. Our kind and wonderful Father, you know that in this small book, there are some very challenging ideas, some things that we need to think very seriously about and find out how it might apply to each one of us as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as friends who might be considering membership, or as people who have never heard of Seventh-day Adventists. We now turn to this book to see what we can discover in today's lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson is all about temptation. When was the last time you heard a whole Sabbath school lesson or maybe a whole sermon about temptation? When I first read that, Ken, I have to say, I thought, sure I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think then that. when you start thinking the difference between temptation and sin, it's different. Yes. yes. Unfortunately, um, as many people know, the Christian church has focused for hundreds of years not on avoiding sin so much, although we all assume that that's our goal. We, 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 we focus on what to do about sin after it's happened. That's not the right approach. Well, here's what our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide says. We all have experienced it. We resolve not to give in to temptation. But in the heat of the battle, our resolve melts, and much to our own sense of shame and self-loathing, we fall into sin. Sometimes it seems the more we focus on not sinning, the more powerless against temptation we feel, and the more hopeless our condition appears. We wonder if indeed we are saved at all. It's hard to imagine any serious Christian who hasn't wondered about his or own, her own salvation, especially after having just fallen into sin. That, of course, is a section for October 11. Well, we believe that temptation leads to sin. Does anybody have any question about that? Mm. So shouldn't we be focusing more on temptation instead of focusing so much attention on sin? I mean, does that make sense? If, we're, if we really want to stop sinning, we ought to be focusing on temptation, because if you can stop the temptation, theoretically you stop the sinning, right? Prevention methods. Prevent, that's my specialty. <laughs> hey, that's why I like this. It's, it's funny that you use just the word temptation in its raw form. Uh -huh. um, what if I get tempted to eat between meals uh -huh. every once in a while, so yeah. when I do that, is that a sin? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want me to get myself in trouble right at the beginning of this? <laughs> Wait a few minutes. <laughs> Wait a few minutes. <laughs> Well, let me, let me be honest. I think any time we do something that we think may be wrong, we're actually committing a sin. We're damaging the neural pathways in our brain. We're saying, it's okay, it's all right to step over that boundary. It's all right to do something which eh, I'm not too sure about because if we do that, then it's easier to do it the next time, even easier to do it the next time, and so forth. So, yes, Gordon. You said we believe that temptation leads to sin. Mm -hmm. Does it really? Or does it well, precede sin? there are some exceptions. Sin? Certainly Jesus had yes. many, many temptations, mm -hmm. we're told. We read in the Bible, and he didn't sin. So does temptation always lead to sin? Well, no. and the answer would be no. Um, however, um, well, we won't ask for personal testimonies right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in Gary's case, <laughs> he's, already, he's already consumed the apple before he's 
realized, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Yeah, that so there was no temptation involved. So well, what is there about a sin? That? <laughs> is right. that the, if there's well, no temptation, can there be any? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we're worried about doing something wrong, um, I know I shouldn't be picking up that thing in between meals to eat it. Um, it's not good for you, right? Right. Well, some people think it's more not good for you more than other people do. That's true. Absolutely so. true. Well, I mean, le okay, let's, let's, let's be honest. Where do temptations come from? Your own desires. Someone's been reading the book of James. <laughs> we go back, and I, I would like to read, starting with verse 12, Happy are those who remain faithful under trials, because when they succeed in passing such a test, and in light of what I said a few moments ago, if you see, succeed in, in, in saying, no, I'm not going to cross that wall, what happens? You build up the wall, right? That becomes a, a more firm barrier. So they will receive as their reward the life which God has promised to those who love him. But then it goes on, and here's the interesting part. What does this mean? If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. How many times have you blamed God for your temptations? I usually blame the devil. <laughs> <laughs> the devil made me do it. It says here, God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Well, with, that was obvious, right? But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Who's the tempter? Satan. Ourselves. Ourselves. That's not what the verse says. Well, <laughs> we got in God never tempts anyone. Uh, in the case of Job, God allowed him to be tempted. Yes. Yeah, so is true. God uh, guilty by omission? It commission yeah. omission? There, yeah. There's another thing too. God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. If that wasn't there, there would be any trouble. Don't be, too, no, no, no. <laughs> don't be yes, too sure. Too Lucifer sent in heaven and there was no tree of knowledge of good and evil in heaven. Mm -hmm. He also traveled to different worlds and they uh, didn't have the desire to be tempted. It was a protection. Well, I'm just going from the Bible here yeah. and saying <laughs> that. But, yeah. but isn't that true though? I mean, I mean the, well, the, the, the temptation. And uh, you said that we go on our own evil desires. Was evil. Did Eve have evil desires when he got, she got tempted and she... She was enticed by... She was deceived. I suppose in her case she would say the evil desire was being deceived. Is, is this a bit closer to the saying, if you don't want the devil's wares, you don't go into his shop? Yeah, something like mm -hmm. that. But it was in the garden. The, yeah. the, the knowledge of good and evil. But it you was couldn't one, get out of being in the shop. It was yeah. the one place they were told not, not to go. To go. Wasn't but it's in the garden. It was right next to the tree of life. How in the world well, are you going to avoid it? The rest, the next verse says, <laughs> Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's a pretty serious sequence, isn't it? Yeah. And, and following that line, the devil doesn't have to do much. He could just be vacationing on the Riviera and we do it. All of his friends, that's what he does. <laughs> if we could recognize temptation sooner or quicker, would that help? Would we be more likely to would we be more likely to be able to avoid it if we said, Oh, there it comes. So do we sin because of temptation or because of habits or both? Well, that was one of is the there still Is there still a temptation when it's my habit to do something that's wrong? And my problem is genes. Yeah. <laughs> Blue jeans? That's why you wear shorts all the time. <laughs> it's my genes. Well, <laughs> inherited all this. Parents? Inherited all these bad things. I should read to you at this point where Ellen White says, God has given us the power. He's willing to work with us to overcome every hereditary and cultivated tendency to evil. Well, don't read that. Even the cultivated <laughs> ones, huh? Okay. Well, I, I, let's, let, let's, let's 
just mention the obvious now. Both temptation and sin always start in the mind. I don't think anybody would argue with that, right? We only sin because we choose to do so. Now we may have chosen to do so many times in the past, that do it so many times in the past, and now it's just sort of automatic. But it was a choice to do so. What, what's the what's the old saying that the devil maybe did it, do it the first time, but ever since I've done it on my own? Yeah, something like that. You know, or like the little boy who, who was kicking and hitting and spitting at his little brother, and his mom stop that. Don't you know that? The devil makes you do all that? And he says, well, maybe the hitting and the kicking was the devil's idea, but the spitting was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about temptation now. Would it be true that if we could avoid temptation, we could avoid sin? And we got some verses on this, so. Well, I, I kind of remember when Noah got out of the ark Mm -hmm. and his family, before they did anything. They built an altar. Well, not only that, but um, God said that men um, sin since they're, from, from the time that they're born, they, they mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that with, to them when they hadn't even done anything yet. Well, so I just wonder if, if sin is really what the Lord's you know, trying to get us to understand is something that goes beyond just doing something. Well, yeah, we're going to have a whole lesson about that coming up. So, yeah, you're right. Well, in, in response to your, your question a minute ago, Ken, uh, let's, suppose, um, let's suppose you have a problem with alcohol and uh, so you're driving down the road and you see the bar. Um, you you choose not to go under the bar, so therefore you avoid that, the temptation that, 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 time. That, that is in the bar. But you've made it the temptation, at least in a little ways, before the temptation got overwhelming when you got in the bar, you resisted the temptation to go into the bar. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. That's, I'm not, yeah, I'm, that's yeah, an improvement. The thing is, I can go into a bar anytime I want. I'm not tempted at all. No, no, that's, I've that's, never drunk. I've never had alcohol. Yeah. Never, really, never, yeah. never, ever, ever. Yeah, that's and fine. So, so I'm never going to be tempted. So if he avoids the, the yeah. bar, you know, and I avoid the bar. It's, it's but that, no, no, no. How no. are you gonna? He's 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 talking about someone who avoids his particular temptation and sin. Now we won't talk about your temptations and your sins right now. But so. you, have, you have something <laughs> about when when the sin actually occurred and yeah. and um, but, but if the thought is there, then the temptation is there. But, yeah. but my point is, you know, how come when he goes into the bar, he's tempted? And well, I'm not. Well, the answer is what, yeah, what it happens in your brain. It has nothing to do with the bar. Well, it has a little bit to do with the bar. But basically, the issue happens in your brain. Th something that's a terrible temptation for one person isn't a temptation at all for another person because they think about it differently. That's why the Tenth Commandment really covers, yeah. deals with all the prior nine. Uh -huh. uh, the, the evil begins in your brain. Yeah. It has to do with all the prior choices that yeah. one has made. That's right. And as Jack Provencia once said, you know, he's not, when he goes, drives by a, a bank, he's not tempted to go in and rob the bank, but someone else is. It's because of all the decisions he's made before that. Yeah. Okay, so we're all sinners anyway. Some people have to, to, to sure. you know, make the decisions and they're, they're weak now and some people aren't. That's right. But um, is any one of those guys any better? Well, I'm going to leave that up to the Lord to make a decision about that. <laughs> We're but all what, 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 what are the possible ways? Now let's talk about what we can do to try to avoid this. Ephesians 6.17 says, We have available to us a sword of the Spirit. What would be the sword of the Spirit? The Bible. Psalms 119.11 says, I keep your law in my heart so that I will not sin against you. That's a pretty obvious comment, right? 
They also call it the helmet of salvation. <laughs> yeah. And Luke 4, 8, Jesus answered the scripture, says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So if we worship God, we read the Bible, we reverence God's law, does that protect us? Different people to varying degrees because there are people who have the Bible all the time. We've heard of preachers and people who commit all kind of sin, mm -hmm. who are drunkards and chase women or whatever and do all kind of thing and are even drug addicts. But it depends on the, a person. Like Gary yeah, mentioned, mm -hmm. I've never drunk, but in way back 1982 or what have you, I, I smoked. I smoked marijuana. Because I wanted, because nobody in my family ever did it. Because I'm from the Caribbean, not Jamaica. When I'm saying I'm the Caribbean, people think, oh, like Jamaican who, mm -hmm. who smoke. We Asians don't. I don't know now, but then I've never seen it. I never heard of it. So I wanted to try it, but it wasn't. It wasn't something. I didn't see what the big who was, mm -hmm. so I just left it alone. Just like drinking, I never like. Yeah, I never wanted it. I never felt like drinking. Okay. I don't think women should drink. I thought it was kind of yeah. be. <laughs> We need to be honest about a few points. First of all, as already been mentioned, Jesus was tempted. Uh, you can be sure the devil tried every temptation he could possibly imagine on Jesus. We, we read about the temptations out in the wilderness. Jesus resisted. And he resisted by quoting scripture. We know that. I think what the, what the, the text that we just referred to, I think what, the, what it's saying there is that this is a tool Mm -hmm. that you can use. If you need some weapons, there's quite a few weapons, but this is a real good one, a very yeah. powerful weapon. Yeah. It's a real, this is a sword. Jesus was constantly in tune with his Father. And I think, I'm sure, I, mean, I, want, I want to think about how this might apply to us. As a result of being constantly in tune with his Father, he recognized temptation immediately. I, I think the devil didn't get even close to him before Jesus recognized what he was up to. And of course, he repulsed it, he rebuffed it. Uh, did Jesus ever have to go overcome a bad habit? He never had one, <laughs> I know of. So that would be a head start, right? Not to have the bad habits. Well, if he inherited um, Human things needs. that humans inherited, um, some tendencies, maybe. Huh? That, that is correct. Maybe there may have been tendencies from habits from his ancestors. So how would yeah, Mary. David had some interesting habits, didn't he? And tendencies. Yeah. Well, how does focusing on the life of Jesus protect us from temptation and sin? Could we, theoretically at least, become so familiar with the story of Jesus that when we're tempted? we would immediately recognize the hazard and the danger and like Jesus turn a deaf ear to the devil? Is that possible? Well, I think when you focus on the life of, of Jesus, um, you become acquainted with Jesus. You become, mm -hmm. there, there's something about the stories in the Bible and certainly stories about Jesus where you, uh, although these people are, um, I mentioned this about Abraham, for example, and you're read about Abraham, he actually, and you, and you think about him, actually becomes almost, uh, almost a father to you, almost real. And it's uh, even, uh, this would be the same with Jesus, I would think, only even more so because Jesus is al alive and well and seeks to have an intimate. Yeah. So but I, would th I would think um, making this, this being a, a friend through acquaintance and so on and so forth, there is a, there is a power there. There is mm -hmm. an association. There is a there is an influence. Yep. Well, reading really remember those verses we just read, James one thirteen to fifteen. It's interesting that in the original Greek, it says each one of these things: temptation gives birth to death. I mean, gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death, basically, and it grows up into death. I mean, this sounds like a very natural kind of process, does it? Doesn't it? Can we prevent sin from being born in our lives? Well, think about the very first sin. We've already mentioned Eve very briefly. At what point, the, I, I've heard this discussed at almost ad nauseum, but not with you, so let's 
Get your opinion. <laughs> At what point did Eve sin? Just a couple lines above, you said temptation does not lead, does not become sin until we yield to it. Mm -hmm. So, does yielding mean an action, or is it all in the head? I thought I'm asking you to tell me. Uh, I think she, as Norm Peckham would say if he were sitting here, the sin occurred when she transferred her allegiance from God to the uh, creature in the tree, from the creator to the creature in the tree. Okay, so let's, let's go through the steps. It probably wasn't a sin for her to wander away from Adam. I think it happened unconsciously. It may have been a day. It turned out to be a dangerous thing, but it probably wasn't a sin. Okay, was it a sin to to come close to the tree of knowledge of good and evil? They had to do that to get to the tree of life almost every day, didn't they? So that wasn't a sin. Was it a sin to hear the serpent speaking to her? No, I mean she had any control over that. Um, was it a sin to talk to the serpent? You can see we're on a slippery slope here, but no, it probably wasn't a sin to talk to the serpent. So where did the sin happen? The real sin happened when she re took her, 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 her faith, her trust, away from God and placed her trust in the talking serpent. She says, right now, instead of trusting what God told me, I'm going to trust what the serpent says. Because, man, man oh, look at have you seen this before? Look at this, the serpent is talking. There's got to be some kind of magical power here, right? Well, it depends and how long they've been living. Yeah. Because I don't know if they've seen everything yet. That's right. We've discussed that in other areas. Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it couldn't have been that common that something that's, well, it's always presented as a big python that talked. They, could, they couldn't have been up every tree. That had to no. be something odd. No. Well, the sad part is this person that we call the devil that appeared first in that tree, although you can't tell from the original passage in, in Genesis that it was the devil, we can read in Revelation 12, verse 4, with this tail he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to this earth. And then later on, down in, uh, I'm just going to read verse 9 of Revelation 12, the huge dragon was thrown out, that's out of heaven. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, that ancient serpent, notice, called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. And if we read on into chapter 13, what do we discover? The whole world is wandering after him. The whole world, it says, except for a few. Well, Let's talk about personal experiences. Personal experiences have a lot more impact than, than just theoretical stories. When we are tempted, what do we, how do we respond? Now, try not to make your sins too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, but let, let's, let's, let's be honest here. Why is sin attractive to human beings? Couldn't God have made it so that sin would not be attractive to us at all? Good question. <laughs> you know, various sins, as you mentioned before, are of greater temptation to some than others. But is there something common to all sin that is there that is the key ingredient that it doesn't make any difference what what one person is responding to? There, there is a core thing there. What what's that? Yeah. What's the common thing? Uh, in response to all, if I wanted this now, we, we, let's not popsicle in between yes. meals here, let's let's be careful here now because do we want to suggest that maybe there's something wrong with the way God made us and that that allows the devil to tempt us? You say we no. no. But it's easy to say no. But if we're saying we all have a sinful nature. And in the next breath, we say we're made in the image of God. Those two things don't seem to kind of really mesh, but wow. it's, it's, it's kind of strange. And also, we're using temptation, temptation, and often that word is used when we talk about sexual matters, or it's always negative, something we're tempted to do, something negative. But when God told people to go and multiply the earth, 
you know, they had to get together and yeah. feel something to do that. But in every other way, people are like, oh my God, don't say this, this is bad. So I don't get it. It's very mm -hmm. confusing. You know, we're, we're kind of talking about sin as a behavior. Okay. Is that what we're talking about? Everything. Well, we suggested that sin, sin starts in the mind. Well, that's true, but it <laughs> Jesus starts said, in the mind. But Jesus said that like, very clearly in, in Matthew 5. Yeah, that, that's true, but then we, we point at the behavior and say, there it is, that's sin. But, and but why, do we, that, do, why do, that, do we do that? Well, because I can't see inside I'm, your brain. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, though, I'm looking at the sin. Uh -huh. Because you can look at sin as there's a, there's a result to sin or mm -hmm. to bad decisions. You get mm -hmm. you get results back and they're bad. Mm -hmm. But why is it that a bad behavior comes back as death? I mean because because well, we know there's why not why not just make the whole universe um, okay whatever you do. Blood be on your own head, because mm -hmm. um, uh, not, when you not do somebody else, when you do well, even that, even that, because um, it's it's going to make a bad bad thing happen. I mean, you're going to get bad results back. We we, we know so that. So why shouldn't that be sufficient instead of just saying, well, what you're going to get back is death, because God's going to make it that way. Well, does God always make it that way? Well, we're all going to die. If, if, I mean, you know, God, God, God I mean God he's going to get rid of sin somehow, and they're all going to die. God doesn't make this. You make choices, and those choices separate you from God. That's what sin is. It's, uh, it's choices which, which result in a self-separation or a distancing from God, and because God is a life source, you get so far away, you, yeah. you, you, you're you going to cease to exist. So. It, that's really what it. What God does not impose this this consequence on you. You're making choices which separate you from from God, and and you die. So you you cease to exist. But there's the devil is pretty bad right now, and he's still existing. So why is he Wait. still existing? If okay, he's well, gone away so far. Well, it's keeping him alive. Well, why doesn't he just keep everybody <laughs> alive for forever then? How long well, do you want? Well, some people believe that. You know, well, you well, I, the, you're evading my question. No, why no. not? Well, the answer, the answer is, to how long do you want this mess to go on? Do you want it to come to an end or not? Ultimately. Well, I want it to come to an end, okay, but I wonder, bingo. I wonder if, if coming and threatening you with death God's by saying that the wage is death. It's a warning. No, listen, I'm just trying to think this out here. I'm okay. trying to figure this out. I'm okay. not trying to, to knock anybody's idea, but I'm just okay. trying to figure this out. Jay, I think you've got there some words from Ellen White that might uh, tell us something about temptation. Well, they're it's awfully dis not real comfortable words. <laughs> uh, it's from uh, uh, Article Signs of the Times, October 4, 1883. Um, it's, here's what she says, by earnest prayer and living faith, we can resist the assaults of Satan and keep our hearts unspotted from pollution. Sounds like James 1, doesn't it? Uh, the strongest temptation is no excuse for sin. However great the pressure brought to bear upon the soul, transgression is our own act. It is not in the power of earth or hell to compel anybody to sin. The will must consent. The heart must yield, or passion cannot overbear reason, nor iniquity triumph over righteousness. Wow. So we go back to James. Look at verses 16, James 1, we're now we're down to verse 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. What do those verses mean? God never changes. Okay, and what's the relationship between God gives us perfect gifts and sin leads to death in the previous verses? Maybe we're not sure. 
<laughs> but what, what is the most important gifts that God gives us? Or potentially could give us? Life. Life. Okay. And not life. just life here and now, eternal life. The power to make choices, to think and reason things out, mm -hmm. and make decisions about okay. whether we whether we want to live with him forever. Okay, and so that is the, if I dare call it a defect that God has placed in us, the power of freedom, the power of choice. And it's that power of choice that makes it possible for us to do what? If God made us all into robots, there wouldn't be any possibility for sinning, right? He would just say, go here, do that, and that, you know, in the electronic voice. <laughs> you wouldn't uh, know what love is either. Yeah, exactly. Because without choice, you don't have love. It's going without, yeah, without choice, you don't have and love. And God, that's the very essence of God's kingdom. So he can't get along without love, and therefore he had to make us with that freedom. He couldn't do it any other way. If, the, if God is love, there's no other possibility to create intelligent creatures that have the, they have to have the capacity to make a choice. I mean, the Bible makes it very clear that God earnestly wants everyone to be saved. It's not going to happen. Why not? Far too many of us choose the devil's way instead of our or instead of God's way. And what's God's response to all that? Ultimately, he has to just let you make live with your decision. He has tried for thousands of years to convince us to change, but as Jim I mean, says, ultimately he'll let us go the way we choose. Even to the point of coming himself and dying the despicable death on a cross, you know, the worst thing that could possibly happen to a person. I mean, how much persuasion do we need? And, and when he says, you're, if you do such and such, the wages of, sin pays its wage, mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. It isn't God's going to impose death on you. It's the way things work. And if you separate yourself from the source of life, you will cease to exist. Okay. Well, is being born again or being born by the Spirit, those are, you know, the passages there in, in John 3, a complete solution to the problem of temptation? How is salvation connected to the new birth? So Healing. all of you who have been born again and been baptized in the Adventist church, or for that matter to any other Christian church, all of a sudden sin is gone and finished, right? No. Wish. <laughs> we wish. Always there. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the point we just used. Okay, if we're like that, even when we're baptized and we're in the Word, we still falter. If I am going to create a child. I've had three children. If I had the power, I would fix them in a way that they would never do anything that would harm them. So sometimes I question how the whole, I don't think we have it all. We don't understand God. We don't understand the whole thing. Because I cannot imagine creating children that you know are going to suffer and die and commit all kind of terrible things and just say, okay, it's their choice. They choose this or they choose that. I think there's more to it than that that we do not understand. Well, but don't you want your children to love you? Absolutely. Well, there you go. But That's I want them to love themselves. <laughs> Parents <laughs> can't learn for their kids. Yeah. And God can't. Uh, God is a teacher, and he yeah. can't it force it, <laughs> his knowledge on you. So some people are just defective in learning. That's right. Really? Romans 8.3 tells us that History God... History shows that. Yeah. Romans 8.3 tells us that God has come, Jesus came, basically, to deal with sin. Yep. To bring us back into harmony with himself. Well, so if that's the case, maybe we need to understand how we got into this mess. And we've already talked about the story of Eve. By proving unequivocally who told us the truth in the beginning. Remember, what was the two sides? God said, if you sin... You will die. Satan said, no, you won't. So who's telling us the truth? Both. But they if, if, you look at, if you look at our experiences, each one individually, if, you, if we each we knew dead. ourselves as God knows us, would we be inclined to say sin leads to death or sin doesn't lead to death? It leads to death. 
I think most of us would say, we're sinners, we're doing fine, we're still here, we're alive, we're breathing, whatever. You know, Gary said that a little while ago, Satan's still alive. And it seems like maybe sin doesn't lead to death. But we all know we're ultimately going to die. That's why Jesus had to demonstrate that well, the results of sin, even on, even on innocent ones, sin has a, plays a toll. I re I'll never forget the experience I had when I first became a physician and some people who were, I guess, a class behind my wife in nursing school, they were driving just a few blocks from where we're sitting here and a guy, drunk guy, came across the median, hit him head on and killed one of them and seriously wounded the other and I had to take care of her in the hospital. Was it their fault? They didn't do anything wrong at all. They so, lived in a sinful earth. Yeah. Well, James goes on, he has some, some interesting comments, interesting suggestions. Verse 19 of chapter 1, remember this, I'm reading again from my Good News Bible. Remember this, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone must be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. Human anger does not achieve God's righteous purpose. What's he trying to suggest now? Well, notice all those things are still there. He's just putting them <coughs> in, a, in a priority. Mm -hmm. And he's suggesting that we very often get in trouble with our words, right? With our mouths. Yes. You know, I'm... Self-control. Are we talking about the title of lesson, the enduring temptation? Are we? The title of that lesson makes me kind of wonder if the person who prepared the lesson knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that right out there. I didn't think we were supposed to endure temptation. I thought we were supposed to overcome it. Okay, but hold on a second. <laughs> Remember, as Gary suggested earlier, that the devil is alive and well. And if he sees you doing very well at avoiding temptation, what's he going to be doing? More. He's going to go after you with everything he's got. Isn't that what he did to Jesus? Oh, but I don't have to endure it. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do our words... Get thee behind me, Satan. There you go. You know, that solves it. Y yeah. How many? Learned five or six words and you got it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why do our words so often get us into trouble? <laughs> People listen to us. <laughs> okay. Words can be very helpful and they can be incredibly destructive. Is it possible for people living in our day to hear the direct voice of God guiding them? Johnny, I think you've got a verse on that one. Yeah, actually when I first read this I had an instant connection, but I'll read it first. When every other voice is hushed, and in quietness we wait before him. The silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us, be still, and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10, and that's uh, Ellen White from Desire of Ages, page 363, paragraph 3. Um, when I was in Micronesia, there would be days where I would uh, go to watch the sunset, and the Pacific Ocean was completely still. Wow. And um, I would just... Uh, spend hours out there just not saying a word just having communion with God and um, really helps in those temptation moments when you have a link and a, a good um, and you you let everything hush and you actually just listen for God and you'll be surprised what would happen if we always offered to even started our day with the silent word of prayer okay God guide me and every time we, we know we're facing a difficult situation. Just a quick word of prayer. Say, God, help me to say the right thing or not to say the wrong thing. Doesn't what he, do you think? Doesn't he know that we need that? Doesn't he give us what we need? But we need to be reminded, and that's why we need to pray about it. We need to be reminded. But what would happen if we did that, if you're assuming that we don't? 
<laughs> well, there. maybe since you're the band with experience, you should tell me what happens. No, no, I just try to try to go from your question there. I mean, you assume that nobody starts at their day in the morning well, right? because you said, "What if everybody did that?" Yeah. Or what if we did that? That means we don't do that. <laughs> and so, if well, we did uh, don't do it, what would happen if we did do it? So I, tell I, us. And, <laughs> I, and, I, and I quote from Proverbs 15. Verse 1, a gentle answer quietens anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Would that be a clue? Let's try Isaiah 50, verse 4. The sovereign Lord has taught me what to say so that I can strengthen the weary. Every morning he makes me eager to hear what he is going to teach me. Would that be a good thing? What about Ephesians 4, 29? Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed, so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. Sure. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? And I could go on. Well, l l l we've suggested that Jesus is our example. Think about the stories you know from the Gospels. The people who followed Jesus, who were listening to his words and so forth, what did they think about his language? What did they, why were they hanging on his words? One thing was rational. They could relate to it. They, they, the stories he told. Uh, you know, in, in a number of places it says, he taught as one who had authority. Not like the scribes and Pharisees. What would that, why do you think, I mean, what, what's implied by that? One who had authority. I mean, believe me or I'll... No. Yeah. He never said that. <laughs> okay, but you said authority, and that's, that's I'm, what comes I'm, I'm out of my not, mind when I say authority. <laughs> okay. I'm not talking about that kind of authority. <laughs> okay. That's your kind. No, 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 no. no. I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't point I, I'm any. I want to ask, why, what was it about Jesus that gave him authority? Well, if you met Matthew, Matthew, what, 13, 33, or 4, somewhere there, it says Jesus did no teaching except by the means of parables, tell, told yeah. stories. And it wasn't until the end right there when he says, now I'm going to tell you plainly about the Father. Mm -hmm. Apparently he hadn't been doing that all up until that time. Mm -hmm. And so apparently you, you can't just punch if, people in the face with, with, with the if, plain truth. You have to make it real life to them. If he had told the Pharisees plainly about the Father, how do you think they would have responded? No, they, they, Kill that man they, they, right now. Yeah, yeah, we couldn't. Yeah. They, they tried it very early in his ministry. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess the authority, I, I would think it is. I think what you're looking for is the one that, that, have you ever talked to somebody that really knows what he's talking about? Can you tell the difference between a guy that fakes it mm -hmm. versus a guy that really knows what he's talking about? Yeah. If he talks about engines? Yeah. You know, a guy comes in and says, oh, I know all about engines, and he kind of fakes it, and you get a guy in there that knows all about engines, and he'll tell you, connect everything together, and, and yep. make it plain, and all that. I mean, that's, I guess that's the authority I, that you're looking for. Well, I'll give you an example from my experience today. I had a late patient, a woman patient come in, and her husband came with her. And after I'd sort of talked to her for a moment or two, he he had to speak up. He says, you know, the last time we came in here, you told me to do a certain exercise to take care of a problem. He said, it went away. It's amazing. He, he thought he was going to have to have surgery. He thought, who knows what was going to happen. And I said, no, you just do this simple exercise and I'll take care of it. He says, it's amazing to talk to someone who knows how to take care of things. <laughs> I mean, that, that, I mean, the point is, when Jesus spoke and you listened, when he got to the end, you say, Inherently, you, you, you know from your own life experiences exactly what he said was true. It just, I mean, it was so obvious to true that, that you know, you, well, why, why didn't I think of, kind of that kind of, you know, why didn't I think of that kind of There's stuff? nothing ostentatious about mm -hmm. Christ's activity. Yeah. Simple and to the point. Well, he, he had two kinds of authority. Number one, he was the authority. But at the same time, it's our understanding that he didn't do much of anything that we could not do if we access the same power. So we too can 
be authorities in whatever way God wants us to be authority if we will access um, the power or the way that God wants us to, whatever he wants us to access. The Bible has some very interesting things to say about how we're supposed to deal with sin as we try to endure temptation. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> um, it's very interesting if you go back to Zechariah 3 and where our time is running away from us here. You go back to Zechariah 3. What happened to those filthy garments that, that Joshua the high priest had on when they got ready to put the new garments on him? They were taken off. They were taken off and removed. And there's a whole bunch of verses. If you happen to get our handout, which, avail which is available to anyone who wants to look on the website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can get this handout. There's a whole bunch of verses that say, take it off, get rid of it, put it away. You know, that's what's supposed to happen to sin. And then, of course, God can put on the clean, pure, white garments. So we're not supposed to cover up those old things, huh? Well, why is it that Christianity seems to so popularly suggest it? All you have to do is be, you know, here you are, dirty and full of grime and all that kind of stuff. Just cover you over with the righteousness of Christ. Does anybody do that in real life? I hope that's, not. That's really the way you would speak without authority. Yeah. You just you just dazzle the people for a while, maybe on, on a Sunday morning or whatever, and, and uh, tell them that Jesus paid the penalty for their sins, and uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't compute in real life. Mm -hmm. But the symbolicness of that, mm -hmm. there is symbol, symbolism there. Yeah. But you ask the question as if it was kind of a physical question. Well, that's the way it's presented in Zechariah 3. Yeah. It's exactly the way it's presented. Well, you know, back in those days, uh, clothing kind of meant a lot of things because uh, mm -hmm. you'd have the, the, you know, the slaves would, would have the more co coarse woven yeah. tunics and then you'd have the more expensive stuff that, that um, other people would have. Yeah. And they could, it would really relate to these people when you started moving the clothing around. Mm -hmm. Well, the new birth is always the work of the Holy Spirit. Just as we're not responsible for our first birth, we are not responsible for the new birth. But in the case of the new birth, we have a choice. We can allow God to implant the Holy Spirit in our lives, or we can refuse to allow Him to do so. I think we have some words about that as well. Gary, you got that one? Uh, this comes from page... 311, paragraph 2 of The Desire of Ages. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. Wow. Gordon, I think you have something to add to that? Yes. From Desire of a from Christ's Object Lessons, page sixty seven to sixty eight. If you have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the uh, talk of the love of Christ, tell of his goodness, do every duty that presents itself, carry the burden of souls upon your heart, and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase, your convictions deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. Wow. So if we allow Christ, Jesus to come into our lives and cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the new birth, how do we come to regard sin? This is a paragraph that I, I have to go back and read it again and again. It's, it's, it's so incredible that it just seems almost impossible. God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in his estimation as well as in that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, 
no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins that are especially offensive to God, for they are contrary to the benevolence of his character, to that unselfish love which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. Steps to Christ, page 30, paragraph 1. Wow. So what, what is it exactly that God doesn't like the most? I didn't quite catch that. Pride, selfishness, covetousness. And what difference is that from the other sin? Well, make it the, less, make it the reason that's so, so serious is because it tends to make us think we're all right. We don't need help. Well, it's a pretentious, a pretentious piety. Nauseating. It's nauseating to the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so you can have a pretty bad sinner, and if he knows that he needs help, he might be better off than a lot of people that... Um, yep. Well, I mean, Jesus illustrated that, didn't he? The two people came to the square to pray, and there's the Pharisee. Oh, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other sinners <laughs> like this guy right over here. And the publican, the tax collector, who was despised by everybody, said what? Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And which one went home justified? The publican. The publican. So that almost indicates that we can never be really confident or sure of our, of our faith, of our relationship, or... <clears throat> or else yeah. you'll start getting confident, right? I mean, we're, always, we're always bad, so... But you can get to the we're point... We're always better, th we're better than we were, but we're still bad. You can get to the point where you're confident about God, though. That God will always do the right yeah. thing. We're always subject to messing up. You know, if you're if you're really worried about how selfish you are, is, isn't that going to be a problem too? Uh, isn't a better way to, to look towards God and try to find well, His value? I'm going to ask the question now. Why is it so much easier for most people to spend an hour watching television, or surfing the internet, or even reading a novel than it is to spend an hour reading the Bible or the writings of Ellen White? There you go. Do we clearly un recognize what benefits are available as a result of spending time with God and His Word? Well, there's a story that's re repeated in our, in our lesson I would like to read. It's brief here. A nickel perverse, that was the deal young Barry's mother made with him and his brother. For every Bible verse memorized, they were five cents closer to their goal of buying a big Snickers candy bar or a Sugar Babies, a soft, chewy milk caramel candy. In order to reach their goals faster, the boys combed through their Bibles looking for the shortest verses to memorize. I've had this experience with my grandchildren. But one day, memorizing scripture became more than just a way to buy candy. When I was 13, remembers Barry, I memorized Proverbs 1, verse 10. Quote, my son, comma, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. That very day, two young men from my neighborhood asked me to help them get back at someone. I felt the power of Proverbs 1.10 reverberating in the corners of my spirit, and on the strength of that verse, I refused to go with them. They didn't just get back at someone, they murdered someone, Barry said. Their sad saga was played out on the evening news, and the judicial conclusion was life in prison. One of the gentlemen, in fact, the gentleman who asked me to go along, Barry says, but I didn't do it. The other guy did it. But it didn't make any difference. They both received the penalty of life in prison. This means that had I gone along with them, even if I had stood there quoting scripture, I would have received the same penalty. And it gives a reference to where that was found. And here's the end of the story. Because of the power of that verse and of his determination to claim and follow it, rather than living out his life behind bars, Dr. Barry Black serves 
as the 62nd chaplain of the U.S. Senate. And he is a Seventh-day Adventist. We look with horror at the possibility that a young boy could do something foolish and spend his life in jail. But in reality, how does that compare with Christians who fritter away their lives in little sins and end up losing eternal life? Which is a bigger loss? Could you make a list of the evil desires in your own life? Yeah, you, don't, you don't have to share it with anybody. Have you experimented with God's ways of overcoming those evil desires? How much time each week do we spend getting better acquainted with Jesus and working on our faith relationship? Memorizing scripture, we've talked about the experience of Barry. Memorizing scripture has almost become a lost art. Is it time for us to resurrect that lost skill? There's a free app available on the internet that can be very helpful to memorizing scripture. Go to HTTP, you know this, forward slash, forward slash, scripturetyper.com. That's scripture, S-C-R-I-P-T-U-R-E, typer, T-Y-P-E-R, because it's talking about actually typing it out. scripturetyper.com to get the details. If you do not have a computer, try putting passages of scripture or perhaps paragraphs from Ellen White on flashcards and memorizing them. How do you think that would impact us if we actually did that? You're going to tell me which version I should memorize? No, take your choice. <laughs> take your choice. I'm not going to tell you which version. If you go to Scripture Typer, because I've been there, if you go to ScriptureTyper.com, it, it gives you a choice. I think it's the 10 or 12 most commonly used versions. And you can pick. It, they'll, they'll just load up. If you say, I want to memorize that verse, it'll load up for you. Right on your phone, right on your iPod, whatever. Hmm. Right there. ScriptureTyper.com Hasn't the time come for Christians, for Christians to abandon their evil desires and stand firmly on holy ground? Do we really believe that that's possible? Enduring temptation, Jay. We don't have to sit there and play with it pretend like we like it, but we don't really want it. No. All we have to do is say, God, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Let me focus on you. Let me focus on the life of Jesus. I want to stay away from temptation. And God says, that's exactly what I'm asking. Thank you.